Is Bitcoin the mother of all bubbles? What's behind DeFi's extraordinary growth? And how is Binance, one of the world's largest cryptocurrency exchanges, reshaping the future of finance? Welcome to The Word on the Block, the series that takes a deeper dive into blockchain and the emerging technologies that shape our world at the intersection of business, politics, and economy. It's what we cover right here on Forecast News. I'm Forecast Editor-in-Chief Angie Lau. Well, we saw a massive sell-off of Bitcoin after it reached a new all-time high of 41900 And then Bank of America's chief investment strategist called it the mother of all bubbles, while J.P. Morgan predicts Bitcoin will go over $146,000 as it competes with gold as an alternative currency. Who's right? Well, how about if we ask the man who made the bet before the institutional pundits all weighed in and created a marketplace for crypto? Let's welcome co-founder and CEO of Binance, Chang Peng Zhao, or better known as CZ. CZ, welcome to the show. Hi, Angie. Thanks for having me on the show. It's it's great to have you. It's your first interview of the year. So thanks for welcoming 2021 with us right here at Forecast. But yeah, I mean, how did things kick off for you? Uh, There's no doubt a lot of volume, a lot of trading volume, and a lot of activity on Binance since the start of the year. Yeah. Yeah, I think things, things are really, really busy. I think 2021 kicked off in, in high gear. So um, I think end of 2020, we saw the Bitcoin price going up and institutions coming in. And that just continued now. And um, the first two weeks of um, uh, 2021, I think we've seen five or six all-time highs, both in terms of price and also system volume. So we're seeing a massive number of users coming in now. So, um, but if, so um, everything's really busy. Everything's really uh, cranked up. Everything, everything's in high gear. So things are, things are going pretty well from that perspective. Are these new accounts and what are the volumes that they're trading? Are, 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 do they suggest that they're retail investors or are they, are they bigger, more sophisticated investors making a bigger bet? What, what is um, the makeup in your view? Yeah, so we, have, we actually have seen an increase in both institutional and retail. So um, we've seen also uh, some older accounts waking up, like people uh, contact, contacting our customer support saying they forgot their passwords from two years ago. Uh, so now they're finally back. Um, I even have friends with, uh, calling me saying they have an account that lost, they lost to FA uh, because they changed phones. Um, so uh, we've seen some of that, but we're seeing also a massive uh, number of new users come in. Uh, from a user volume, like from a peak user trader volume perspective, it's much, much higher than the peak of 2018. Uh, or to uh, end of 2017-ish. So, um, and we're also seeing a lot of new institutions coming in, in this round. So I think now, uh, especially given the high profile institutions coming in, in the US um, worldwide, um, there's many institutions coming in now. So we're seeing a mix of them. Uh, the proportions are actually pretty much the same as before. So we haven't seen one rising above the other, um, but it's just massive volumes increasing all around. Um, so, which is pretty interesting to see. Yeah, as you know, you know, institutional investors uh, like Guggenheim and Mass Mutual and others uh, and really bringing in those dollars as you track trading volumes and flows. What do you think is behind the, the, the demand for Bitcoin? What, what is creating that floor for the value? Sure. I think, well, if you look at the really fundamental uh, parts, Bitcoin is just a better form of value. So it is a better form of money uh, in a sense. So it has a lot of advantages over traditional fiat currencies, especially. So, but I think there's a number of uh, contributing factors for people realizing that and for corporates and institutions realizing that and then rushing in, into, this, um, uh, into this industry now. Um, I think in 2020, um, that was a pretty crazy year. So uh, the COVID uh, paused all economic activity globally. And then this quantitative easing by every country. And I think like 20 to 30% of the US dollars were printed last year, which means basically, and other countries are probably printing more uh, than that. So basically, which means that if you're holding fiat currencies, um, you probably, your, uh, your purchasing powers were probably devalued by 20 to 30% if you keep holding on to it. Um, and then we've seen that um, the corporate treasurers, of course, these are the professional users, these are the uh, experts that understands economy and understands um, uh, money. So they now have to manage their corporate treasury. So they're, they're now allocating into uh, Bitcoin or other cryptocurrencies. 
And then this kicks off a race uh, that kind of, uh, that's the institutional race right now that we're seeing uh, in North America and also in the rest of, part, in the, rest of the world. And then once the price started, starts to go up, all the retail guys fl uh, flood in as well because they, everyone wants a piece of the um, uh, a rising value. So I think there's multiple factors contributing to it, um, but the overall economic situation last year and, uh, definitely contributed to that. Um, and then the um, so and then DeFi is pretty hot. Um, the OGs in the industry are, are rushing into DeFi, um, uh, including ourselves. So um, I think there's a number of contributing factors, but uh, there's nothing really negative about cryptocurrency. Um, the regulations are getting clearer um, for around cryptocurrencies and cryptocurrency businesses. Um, Bitcoin and Ethereum, the top uh, cryptocurrencies, are generally viewed to be accepted as uh, as non securities, etc. In most countries, so um, and there were also uh, uh, seen as um, a valid assets. Uh, their court cases protecting users' assets, etc. So I think a number of those things have, have all came together. Um, so um, there's multiple factors contributing to the ride, but they all feed on each other. So now we're seeing like a, uh, I would say, a bull market. Why do we see such volatility? I think that you know it, it it's par for the course for those of us who have been tracking it. Uh, but for for th these huge price swings for more conservative investors who are, who are observing this space. Why is there such massive volatility? Um, well, I think in every market there's volatility. Um, so if, 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 you look, if you base yourself in any asset, every other asset uh, is gonna be volatile, um, price change. Um, and every other asset is, ma is a massive psychology play. <laughs> And um, also, um, Bitcoin's volatility is actually s lower than, for example, even Tesla's. Um, Tesla's gone up really uh, <laughs> a lot, and then the corrections, of course, then uh, there's volatility. Um, yeah. So uh, it's, it's actually less than Apple's Tesla's stock volatility. So it's, not, it's nothing, uh, it's, and it's also about the same market cap. Uh, around those areas. So um, uh, it's actually not out of the ordinary. Um, volatilities do happen in, um, in trading markets where um, the asset is actively traded. Um, and uh, this natural press discovery and this mass psychology going on. Um, everyone wants to rush in uh, to, and then the price goes up. And then uh, somebody says, well, okay, now the price is up uh, high enough. They want to cash out a bit and they start selling. Sometimes that triggers the cycle and then everyone wants to sell. Um, and especially when prices go up, go up really, uh, really heavily. So I think we've probably seen Bitcoin going from like 10,000 to 40, 41,000 in about in the, in the span of like a, a month or two. Uh, when that kind of price rises at 20% uh, correction is very, very normal. And especially considering a lot of the new guys coming uh, buying at the new higher prices, they are not the sort of uh, uh, what we call strong hands holders um, that, that, that are in this for the long term. Many of them are for short term gains. And then as soon as they see any price drop, they, they rush to sell. So then they're not, they're not yet the core believers. They have not converted 100% um, of their wealth into crypto. So there, there are different stages of people. So the corrections are very, very normal. So um, I, I don't think it's anything out of the ordinary. And I think we'll continue to see corrections and volatility um, going forward. But um, compared to other similar market size, uh, market cap um, assets, um, Bitcoin is actually not that volatile now. I and mean, you do know the speculative nature and the volatile nature, but hey, when you're in exchange, anytime somebody does a trade <laughs> on Binance, that's, that's dollars uh, <laughs> for your bottom line. Um, you know, that that really is what differentiates, uh, you know, Binance from the very early days, uh, getting into crypto, seeing a, a marketplace, creating a marketplace for exchange. And here you are, fast forward, uh, there's no doubt of the success. How, have, uh, how, how has Binance handled the expansion and handled all of the, the machinations, if you will, from 2019, 2020, and into 2021? Yeah, I think for us, it's really, really just a focus on how to handle growth. Uh, so even in 2008, even in like mid to later 2018, when the Bitcoin price is at rock bottom, like say around $3,000, um, I was telling our team, look, we got to scale up. We got we to gotta be ready for the next wave. So we have been spending the last, the good part of the last two and a half years uh, in expanding our systems, expanding our team, et cetera. 
And to be very honest, even, even today, we have expanded so much capacity, we're still struggling a little bit um, on peak days um, because our system, so there's really a few different parts. There's a system which is like gotta stay up when there's peak volume. And we're seeing 20 to 30 X volumes on a 5% uh, rise of uh, Bitcoin. So um, the volumes on the systems are mar- ex- growing ex- much more exponentially than um, a Bitcoin prices. Um, so luckily we've, we've done a lot of work in the last two years, but the system's not production t- tested at, that, at those volumes. And the system's like a really complex uh, organi- uh, organism right now. There's so many different moving parts. It's like a, it's like a small city um, uh, grid, uh, if, if you imagine. There's traffic going on in different, in, on different roads. And we never really know which road is gonna be more congested before, before time, beforehand. So we actually have to see the new volume coming in and then adjust um, uh, 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 as we grow. So even though the course infrastructure is quite scalable, um, the, we are still seeing some issues here and there as the system grow to newer levels that we have not seen before. So, but the, so far the system has been holding up. The other aspects, the second aspect, which is really hard to scale is customer support. So uh, there's a large, uh, there's still a very large portion of customer support which are handled by humans, and um, you can't just hire 10x hu- uh, team before the before the volume uh, gets there, and the guys everybody will be bored, and that's demoralizing. And then, um, but when the volume hits, you want to hire 10x people. It doesn't happen that quickly. So um, we're struggling a little bit on that front. We're making a lot more automated tools to uh, to help users, etc. But it's going to take some time. So uh, to be very honest, I think we were uh, we were always anticipating this type of wave of growth uh, for the last three years. It's finally happening, which is great. Um, but we are still struggling a little bit to keep up. To be honest. <laughs> I, there's no doubt, and, and, and you know, Binance is not the only exchange that is experiencing server outages and and, and pauses. Uh, Bitthumb, Coinbase, and others. I mean, it's it just seems to be um, increasingly frustrating for for the 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 trader. And then your trading position is suddenly lost or it's paused. People are losing some money here. How are you planning to, to make it right or, or mitigate these system failures? How can users be sure that the, when they want to make a trade in their position that it's going to go through? Um, yeah, so to be honest, there's no 100% guarantee, but um, um, we do have, we, I think we currently, we do have less outages compared to other peers in, in the industry, but that's not to say we're, we're, we're uh, that's not, that's not a valid um, uh, reason or to say that uh, we're okay on any outage. Um, so we do try to minimize it. We can't guarantee that we'll, we will, we will, uh, um, we will avoid all of them. Uh, there's so many different parts. The internet messed up. Google goes down uh, sometimes as well. So um, yes. we, so we do, we do try to uh, to minimize those. One of the advantages we actually have is when Binance goes into system maintenance, for example, you've had to do an upgrade for like eight hours. Um, because we have so much volume uh, on our order book, the price doesn't move during that eight hours because we everybody knows, given the thick uh, order book on our, on, our, on our exchange, when we turn it back on, uh, the price is going to be dra- dragged right back into our spread. So um, so people, the price will naturally come back when uh, to where, where we paused it if we're doing system upgrades. So that's one of the huge advantages for having a big exchange. Um, but we do we do suffer here and there, and we try our best to make it right for users if it's our fault. Um, but sometimes it's very difficult to figure out whose fault it really is. Um, uh, so when there's massive outages, we do we do try to make up for it. Uh, we have a Seifu fund, which is an insurance fund that's used for uh, this type of situations, um, including like security issues, system outages. Even when a third party project gets hacked, um, that coin price goes to zero. We have actually used Seifu fund to cover some of the user positions. Uh, including the cover instant uh, recently. So um, yeah, I mean, there's no perfect solution, but we do, we do uh, put protecting users as our top uh, priority and top uh, principle in, uh, in the team. So everybody on the team knows this is our motto um, and they make decisions that way. But um, we can't guarantee 100%, nobody can guarantee 100% no issues. Uh, we, this is a new industry. Um, the, uh, we, we're seeing like five to 10 X volumes every other month, uh, every month or so. So they just keep going up. Um, and we just have to expand systems so, and also customer support to kind of support that kind of volumes. So it's a challenge, but um, so far we're dealing okay. I wouldn't say super great, um, but I think we're faring better than most other exchanges in the industry. So hopefully uh, we'll, we can continue to uh, grow and cope with demand. 
Well, you seem to be providing some customer service uh, to uh, potentially a VIP client uh, that you're trying to woo over to Bitcoin. This is Elon Musk. We've been enjoying your your Twitter uh, exchange. Uh, you said you're going to buy a Tesla if he buys crypto. He he inferenced that he was curious if you could buy a billion in Bitcoin, and uh, apparently that is possible. Uh, you know, the, a lot of people are paying attention to this because, uh, you know, once upon a time, we didn't think corporate treasuries were getting into the game and, and here they are. Yeah. Yeah. So I think, well, so basically, well, number one, uh, I, I enjoy trolling Elon Musk. So, uh, <laughs> so that, that's always good fun. And uh, he's, he's, uh, he's openly talking about uh, cryptocurrencies, Bitcoin, means Ethereum, et cetera. So, um, but um, I don't think we can get him on Binance.com as a customer just yet, because he's a, I think he, most of his assets are probably in the U.S. and he's probably a U.S. citizen. So I think Binance U.S. is uh, our partner in the U.S. is probably going um, uh, uh, gonna to probably try to win over his business if, if, if if he want, um, if he wants to buy Bitcoin, and I don't have any private information, I don't have a private conversation with him, etc. Um, so, um, but I would imagine that he's probably buying loads of Bitcoin right now, <laughs> trying to figure out ways to buy. Because for for like if, for for corporates in in, in America, that's, that's probably I would imagine that's probably a lot of compliance procedures to go through, um, especially giving a public company, etc., and also being the world's richest man. So um, there's probably a lot of uh, uh, additional hoops that he has to go through to acquire Bitcoin at, at that kind of, at like one a billion dollars of scale. But um, he, he obviously talks about it. He understands it. He knows his, uh, he knows how good it is. So um, I, I wouldn't be surprised uh, in a few months he announces that finally Tesla owns, I don't know how many, how many Bitcoins. Um, and, and that would be really good for the industry. But I think it's going to happen sooner or later. Uh, maybe this year, maybe next year, who knows? Uh, it's gonna I happen. think on the record, he said that he only owned 0.25 BTC. It's not that even, was a few. Not even. Yeah, important. that was a couple of years ago. So we don't know. what well, that's we don't that's know if he added to the position. Uh, well, and that's also him personally. Um, uh, okay. So more more likely, he's, he will have to um, use uh, Tesla corporate treasury to buy first before he buys personally. Uh, that would be the right thing to do because otherwise they may be seen as conflict of interest, etc. So um, um, we, yeah, he hasn't said anything about Tesla or other corporate treasuries. I'm sure he couldn't right now. Um, so someday we may we may see an announcement. I'm pretty sure the day will come. You know, the, 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 fun, the funny thing about Bitcoin is that a lot of people are paying attention to Bitcoin right now. And yet the biggest story of, of last year and going into this year has been DeFi. And I remember sitting down with you a few years back before all of, all of the buzz, we were talking about DeFi, we were talking about decentralized exchanges when really few people were. And here we are in 2021, total value locked is, I think, north of $22 billion right now. Where do you think DeFi is going? Is this the real story we should be paying attention to? And what is Binance's strategy when it comes to DeFi and decentralized exchanges? Sure. Um, I think there's definitely some core value in DeFi. So DeFi is not a Fed that will just go away. Um, so I think there's some core principle, core concepts and core use cases and core uh, applications that will stay. Um, this is a concept of automate, automated market makers, which provides liquidity in a very transparent way. Um, and, um, there's, um, and on the user side, there's liquidity farming. You stake your coins and, and you know how those coins are used. And you can calculate whether you're making money or not. You can check. So it's a very transparent white box, a see-through type of mechanism for users to um, lock their cryptocurrencies and make the cryptocurrencies earn interest for you. Uh, whereas now in the fiat world, most of the um, banks are now starting to charge negative interest rates and they're pretty heavy. So, um, so I think there's a, definitely a core use case for that. That's a very valid use case. Um, having said that, I think um, uh, we're seeing the first iteration of DeFi right now. Um, and as in any industry, um, there's a very high chance of failure. It does not mean what well, most DeFi projects probably will fail. Um, there will be a few that will be successful and a, a very high likelihood those are going to be second generation DeFi projects. 
um, Google is not the first engine, uh, first search engine. Ba Facebook is not the first social media. So um, there's uh, 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 there's a learning curve for any new industry. So right now, I think they, uh, uh, for the projects that's already in the industry, I hope they become successful. But the chances are there's going to be a very high, large number of failures. Um, but I think the industry will definitely stay. Um, the concept works. The concept is good. Um, there will be more iterations based on those concepts. And um, um, I think yeah. So basically, it, it uh, is a very is a it is a very compelling use case. So I think DeFi is going to grow. Um, at the same time, I think DeFi is sort of uh, if you look at the population mass adoption as a whole, um, ninety nine point eight percent of the population still don't have crypto of any kind. So we we look for, when we speak about when we speak about DeFi, we're talking about the the marketplace in that zero point two percent market share. Um, the rest of the world are still figuring out how to buy Bitcoin. And those guys are going to go on a fiat to crypto exchange to buy Bitcoin. So there's still a very, uh, and uh, DeFi uh, cannot interface with banks or traditional payment channels. So uh, they use stable coins and other, uh, other mechanisms. So I think there's still a very large place for, uh, for uh, centralized exchanges, uh, CEX, um, to service the sort of facilitate the next mass adoption that's going to come in. So I think there, there, there are demands for, uh, for all business types. And for Binance, we actually offer products in both places, uh, in multiple uh, we give users multiple options. So we do offer a DeFi, well, a number of DeFi, we, do, we offer Binance Smart Chain, which uh, on top of that, there's a, a number of DeFi solutions uh, growing on that. That's, that's an entire ecosystem on its own. And we're trying to add similar kind of services um, on the CEX, on the centralized exchange. So we're providing liquidity mining, yield uh, staking, um, uh, uh, super savings, uh, super earnings type of products on on the CEX as well for sort of mm. the kind of novice users. So um, yeah, we try to give users options, and then we we want to yeah we'll feed, we'll see how the industry grows. I mean, with the current state of Binance Smart Chain as it relates to DeFi, you're also planning uh, work on a stable coin. I understand. Yes, so we actually have been working on multiple stable coin projects. So we have a uh, we have we have a sort of a basket project that's called Venus. Um, that's not a specific coin. Well, now there is a specific coin called Venus, um, but originally it was a basket project that's um, uh, targeting multiple uh, stable coins. So we have fiat backed stable coins like BUSD, which is actually not issued and minted by us. It's actually minted by our, um, uh, our partner in the US, Paxos, uh, which is a NYDFS regulated entity. So they, uh, they hold all the money. They are fully audited. They're, they're constantly being audited. Um, so it's, it's, it is a uh, fully, it is a very transparent and fairly safe um, uh, stable coin. Uh, we have, we launched GB, uh, BGBP, um, which is the British pound stable coin. We did try Korea, uh, a Korean, uh, Korea one stable coin, but we are going to wind that, wind that, wind that down. Um, uh, that's the kind of like a small failed project. Um, that's fine. Why did it fail? Uh, uh, just not a whole lot of users use it. Um, I think there's hmm. basically the, the, the other fiat to crypto exchanges in the in Korea are very well established. So we did, just didn't see a strong uptake on that on that product. So we try, mm, it didn't work. So we uh, we will wind it down. Um, and then we also launched uh, uh, on Binance Smart Chain. There's a number of stable coins launching on there as well. Um, there's Venus, which is a algor algorithmic uh, stable coin similar to Dai or uh, Ethereum. So um, there's multiple uh, there's multiple stable coin projects going on. Um, I personally believe uh, I don't hold any stable. I don't hold that many stable coins. I only hold like a couple thousand dollars uh, uh, here and there. Um, but um, I think stable coins do serve a very uh, important use case for people coming into crypto, um, and um, for people who wants to uh, hedge against a Bitcoin a price uh, crypto price drops, they can move into stable coin, etc. So they do serve they do serve a pretty important purpose uh, in the in the ecosystem. So I do think they're quite important. You know, you, you talk about uh, this, this brand new space and, and we've been talking to newsmakers, uh, you know, um, as it relates to this space as well. Uh, and you talked about that regulatory clarity that is so important for growth. Do you see that coming into the DeFi space? Ooh, uh, that's a pretty tough one. <laughs> um, I think um, I think we're seeing regulatory clarity in terms of um, a crypto, a recognition of cryptocurrencies as a legal asset to hold in most countries, and in, mo in, in most countries as well, um, crypto crypto businesses are being more and more accepted. Um, but for DeFi, I think it's um, it's still a relatively new thing that came up last year, uh, mid of last year, 
uh, well, that kind of that started like a year ago, but uh, yeah. kind of only really sort of took to uh, grown to a size that's noticeable um, six or six months ago ish. So I think the regulators are probably scratching their heads on how to deal with it. There's, I've seen multiple discussions publicly, and um, um, so it's going to be very tricky. So do they regulate the um, the guys writing code, or do they regulate the blockchain? Like how, how what's there to regulate? So I think that's going to pose some really new interesting challenges for for regulators all around the world. Um, I don't really have a I don't really have good suggestions to be honest. I think that's a really tricky puzzle. And that's a really hard puzzle to solve. Um, but I think fundamentally, though, um, there are some uh, shifts uh, uh, given with DeFi. Um, you can't really regulate uh, what's going on on the blockchain. Uh, I don't think you can regulate a smart contract. Uh, people just write code and deploy on, on the blockchain. And uh, um, if you if you regulate the developers, people are probably going to just do it more anonymously. And people are already doing more doing it more anonymously now. Um, and uh, but I think uh, it does. It, but uh, the, uh, the the current uh, deck uh, DeFi uh, AMMs uh, or liquidity pools actually provides uh, transparency, so you can actually track transactions as they go through um, the DEXs, etc. So you um, uh, there's actually better tracking um, that's provided. That's way better tracking uh, provided by uh, DeFi than traditional tra financial institutions. So the the, the 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 different pros and cons. So um, it's going to be interesting to see how different regulators regular Regulators around the world try to attack that or try to address uh, the DeFi regulations. It's going to be really challenging. Well, you know, it's it's really interesting. We're both based in Asia, and and what's really innovative um, here is that the ecosystem is supported by some really interesting developments, uh, and and sometimes they are, you know, uh, at the polar opposites, um, but but also meet somewhere interestingly in the middle. Uh, and, and really informs uh, a global regulatory audience. Hong Kong, Singapore, these are, these are two uh, really strong uh, entities and, and you know, uh, leaders in this space. How would you compare the two? Oh, um, so I think it's a bit too early to compare um, uh, the two, to be honest. I think basically, um, Asia is quite interesting. So Asia, uh, uh, this China was really, really big, but they kind of don't want, they, they obviously clearly said they don't want exchanges to be operating inside China and the, they are pushing a, a CDBC. So the, they, have a, they have a specific path that's kind of uh, uh, clear. Um, they are promoting blockchain very heavily. They, they're, they're, they're promoting Bitcoin and the other cryptocurrencies much, much less. Um, Hong Kong has a sandbox program, um, uh, and I think there's a, uh, in, a number of Hong Kong exchanges uh, that's fairly active uh, pursuing that. I think BC Group in Hong Kong, uh, I think those guys were um, the same uh, ANX Pro or ANX exchange guys back in the day. So uh, those guys are pushing uh, in Hong Kong quite well. Um, and um, I think uh, basically Singapore has always been very open for fintech uh, in, in, uh, innovation. Um, and um, in, in some of this smaller sort of uh, island or uh, locations where um, they're less concerned about their, their, their own currency, um, their own currency has been uh, 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 Hong Kong dollar, not so much, but Singapore dollar has been free trading against other currencies uh, for the longest time. And uh, I think Singapore dollar have, have no ambition to become the world dominant uh, currency. So it's not trying to compete with US dollars. So I think they uh, this type of, uh, uh, they will probably take a much more open approach to uh, welcome uh, blockchain innovations, cryptocurrencies, et cetera. Uh, there's Taiwan and there's Taiwan and, uh, New and Japan. Japan has legally recognized Bitcoin as a currency uh, from 2017. So they're one of the early adopters on that front, um, but they, um, but the Japan regulations, um, especially for exchanges, have been relatively strict, especially in the number of coins exchanges can list. So they kind of missed out on the sort of uh, L coin uh, L season uh, in 2018, uh, and that's probably why most of uh, the exchanges in Japan have become lower in volume. So um, I think um, uh, Taiwan, I'm actually not so sure. Um, there's there's a lot of discussions in Taiwan, but I have not seen any clear indications of which way. Um, the regulations are shaping up. So um, that's kind of like at a very high level, my limited understanding of the situation. But I think fundamentally though, um, it's good that different places are trying different things. So they're not just, they're not just like exactly copying each other. Um, so Hong Kong had the same box going on. Um, uh, uh, Singapore has been pretty progressive in terms of uh, um, uh, um, DBS is launching a, a, one of the largest banks in Singapore is launching a cryptocurrency exchange. Mm -hmm. But it looks like it's only targeted for like 
large institutional uh, traders, et cetera. So that, that, that kind of tippy toeing, but at least that's like a real big bank uh, uh, offering a cryptocurrency exchange. So that's that's probably the words, one of the words, words first. So I think there's different things being tried in different places. Hopefully uh, we'll, uh, nobody knows which one is better, to be honest, we have to try and see. Um, and uh, whichever works better, the other ones will copy. So, um, so I think that's good that multiple countries are trying different things. So that's really good for the industry. Well, I mean, talk about being a reference point. Did you ever imagine that an institutional bank like a DBS, a, a legacy financial firm, would be getting into your space? I mean, when we talk about reshaping the future of finance, uh, it really feels like what once upon a time were two disparate things are now merging together. They're competing with you in essence. Uh, he, he, uh, yes, they're competing in a very sort of broad way, uh, well, in a very sort of a generic way. But if we, if we look at the product, um, the two products are very, very different. They're geared towards really the traditional institutional uh, investors, which we don't have anyway. So then the, the, there's like from a clientele perspective, there's almost zero overlap. Uh, and also they are increasing the sort of um, credibility and um, uh, validity of, uh, uh, of cryptocurrencies uh, to the traditional users, which have always been somewhat skeptical and slow to adopt. So uh, user base wise, I think there's almost zero overlap. Um, so that's really good. For, and they're growing the industry um, and they, that's good for everyone, for us and for them. Um, and I'm, yeah, as, as you said, I'm really impressed that like a huge uh, uh, old traditional, well, not old, well, kind of old traditional uh, in financial, uh, Older financial than institution. finance. <laughs> for sure, yeah. yeah, and much, much bigger as well. So um, so, um, so it's really good to see that, uh, uh, that happening. And Singapore has always been one of these sort of uh, early innovators in the fintech space. And the, um, so it's really, really good to see that uh, banks in Singapore trying this now. And this is gonna be, um, and uh, everything triggers everything else, right? So this is gonna be a big trigger for the banks in the US, the banks in, in Europe, uh, even the banks in China um, to, or banks in Japan, Taiwan to try to do something along those lines. So everyone, I think everyone, this is a brand new industry. Everyone's looking at each other, uh, looking over their shoulders to see what other people are doing um, and try to copy homework kind of thing. Um, but I think that's really, really good. So I, I, I think DBS come in will really facilitate a lot of traditional banks um, say, look, uh, now I think if you are working at China Merchant Bank, it's probably much easier to get a uh, cryptocurrency exchange project approved. Um, so, uh, well, there's a much higher chance to get that approved because there's a reference point um, of DBS in Singapore. So I think this is, this is super good. So um, we don't view them as competition at all. Um, and I think basically, um, there are different, there are completely different business models being tried and we don't know which one's gonna be big. They may win, we may win, uh, or, or, or we may both survive uh, and, and do well. So I think right now, um, given the, we, we have such a tiny market share in terms of mass, uh, um, mass adoption. So we probably only have 0.2% market share of the world's population. So we, we have to do a lot more to grow the pie. So that's, yeah, that's the focus really. Well, I, I, you also shared a, a forecast um, that you plan for Binance to have profits of eight hundred million to a billion this year. That's up from five hundred and seventy million dollars last year. Uh, a lot of the market uncertainty pushing traders into digital coins uh, was your remark, and that's really what we're seeing. Uh, yeah. But but as you expand your business and your products, what else can we expect from Binance? that gets you to that $1 billion mark. Sure. Um, so, uh, to be honest, um, that was a um, discussion with a four. Uh, sorry, with a uh, Bloomberg uh, journalist. She was really asking and asking about the numbers and said, "Give me a number. Give me a number." So I threw a random number, kind of out of thin air out there. Um, one of the difficulties we have with uh, estimating revenues uh, uh, for our business, especially in U.S. dollar terms, is that changes every minute. Even if nothing happens right now, the Bitcoin price moves every every second, and our revenue moves with it because we only hold crypto. And we only we and there's no single currency we can we can evaluate because we hold like 300 different cryptocurrencies because our income comes through those. So that's a very generic estimate. And now Bitcoin prices have gone so gone up so much. I actually don't know what that number is. Um, but uh, more fundamentally, though, for for uh, for Binance, I think our mission is really just to increase access to crypto. 
So anything that can help people access crypto, we want to we want to provide. Um, so that's kind of the general like sort of uh, overall direction or the larger direction that we ha- we're, we're kind of heading. And that's like for me, that's that's the granularity I tell my team, and then they go figure it out uh, what they want to do kind of within that kind of really band, really broad um, uh, band. And uh, there are a number of things. Um, I think um, I think we're kind of ripe for a payment solutions now. So uh, in, in addition to sort of uh, uh, just exchange trading, uh, f- uh, high frequency trading, et cetera, there's DeFi, there's wallets, um, and then there's also payments. Payments is one of the most obvious use cases um, for cryptocurrencies, but it has not really taken off in any big way um, for a number of reasons. I think we, know, we may know one or two of the reasons and we, we think that we have, uh, we have different solutions that may, that may be able to address those issues. So we're launching a Binance card and we're launching more additional payment solutions um, for crypto. And we're hoping that, uh, that, will, uh, that that's an additional um, uh, point for people to, uh, um, well, there's a little bug here. Um, so that's additional um, uh, 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 solution for people to have more access to crypto. And I think um, payments is really important because it's an off, it's an off ramp. Um, mm. And when when there's a, when you would think that there's a oh, there's a little bug here, um, go get it, go get it. See, yeah, see how, did you did you get it? <laughs> no, it's okay. It flew away. Don't let um, it bug you. But anyway, so um, uh, so basically, um, before uh, without direct crypto off ramps, without payment solutions, people have to think about selling crypto and then converting the fiat, hold fiat, and then pay for their either credit card bills or use that to pay for that, transfer for that to, to their PayPal or um, other payment so, uh, solutions to pay for stuff. Yeah. With a direct payment solution, then people can stay in crypto much longer until to the point where they just wanna pay for, buy a cup of coffee, right. they swipe their, Bin- their Binance card. And for them, they stay, they just paid crypto. Uh, for the merchant, they accepted, they, they got fiat. So we're working on those type of solutions now um, that hopefully will allow people to stay in crypto for much, much longer. And, uh, and they can move much, like for me, I now can move literally close to 100% of my, uh, my, uh, my, my money into, into crypto now. So we're working on a lot of those type of solutions um, on the, so that's on the fiat side. And then there's a DeFi. That's DeFi, the Binance Smart Chain, we're pushing very, very heavily um, with multiple, like we launched a $100 million fund to try to uh, boost, bootstrap the ecosystem, um, et cetera. So we're doing multiple things on those fronts. How, how about acquisitions? You, I'll just remind the audience, uh, Binance acquired CoinMarketCap in 2020. Are you going to ever tell us how much you paid for it? Was it $400 million? Uh, unfortunately, I can't. Um, there's an NDA go- governing the, the. There's an NDA okay. specifically governing the sort of price of that. Um, For a reported so. figure of four hundred million dollars, CZ cannot neither confirm nor deny uh, due to an NDA. Exactly. Uh, it yeah. is held under a holding company. Um, at the time, you said that it was a really good website. You can you think you could help it grow further? What's your vision yeah. for Coin Market Cap in 2021? Um, I think basically uh, we just uh, we just gotta. I think Coin Market Cap just gotta uh, continue to uh, grow the product. I think it has a very good base product, especially in terms of the uh, uh, traditional uh, sort of uh, tra- slightly traditional uh, crypto assets, like the top uh, crypto a- crypto assets. Um, and um, uh, they added a lot more DeFi coins last year. Um, I think they launched the um, new portfolio tracking feature um, uh, just like a week ago. Um, so now they're they're making much faster revamps to the product. So we increased the, after the acquisition, we increased the team size. We added a lot more developers and product uh, guys. Um, and um, so we just want to continue to build the product. Um, I think basically, um, as I said before, uh, we want to increase access to crypto. And I view there's like two sub components to it. Um, there's one access to liquidity, which is the exchange business, which is Binance.com, um, Binance Dex, uh, uh, be it Binance Smart Chain, DeFi, et cetera. Um, there's also access to information. So we, before we had Binance Academy, but now we have, Binance, we have CoinMarketCap, which is the uh, largest website in the, in the industry. That's the highest traffic website. Um, and uh, people go there to, to look for information. So we want to add more and more information that people want to use in a clear and easy to uh, find way. So we don't want to over uh, clutter the page, but we want to f- put more useful information on there. Um, there. There are so many things we can do. If we just look at like a Bloomberg, right? There's so much more use. There's so, there's so many useful information that's on there. Uh, we want to build that type of uh, portal for the crypto industry. 
So um, that's kind of the overall sort of higher level uh, direction. And then the specific features, I'm actually not dictating it. I'm, I'm usually told after they go live. So, um, so the team's working on, 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 on a large number of features. Um, yeah, and also on the acquisition side, we will continue to make a, a, lot, of, a lot of acquisitions. Um, our internal number is usually around 20 to 30 acquisitions a year. Um, we don't really have a hard number, but when we see um, uh, good products uh, with good teams uh, that share the same vision and values with us, um, we try to we try to get them we try to get them our, into our ecosystem. And um, there are a lot of projects which are very good, but they may not have the same kind of monetization strength as Binance. So Binance has a much more solid uh, cash flow. Uh, which can sustain sort of more or less uh, uh, many of our portfolio projects um, so that we can give them a much longer runway, um, much, much, uh, have them focus much more on building products. Um, so we, and also let them have a much longer term vision instead of, hey, um, I got to raise money every six months or so. So um, we got to get them away from that mentality so that they just focus on building products. So we'll continue to do a lot of acquisitions. So acquisitions, what specifically uh, will fit your thesis and, and how much in your war chest have you carved out for acquisitions this year? Um, so um, I think basically we don't have a specific cover out or war chest uh, per se. Um, I think we have probably invested in like, um, I don't know, probably close to billions of dollars uh, in terms of investments. Um, and um, so uh, some of them are like cash based, some of them are equity swaps, some of them are sort of other type of deals, token swap, et cetera. So there's different type of deals. Um, some deals are sort of a, we are just a minority investor and we just get, we just get a, a financial report every so often and we don't interfere with the business, we don't run it. Uh, we try to help it the way we can, but um, we don't, we, we're, we're not an operation team. Um, some we acquire and then we might we try to merge into Binance. So there's like a different degrees of um, acquisitions. Um, so I think so far we, uh, we I think we probably spent about like three years ago, we announced a, a one, oh, actually two, yeah, uh, three years ago now, if we, if, if we calculate to 2021. Uh, in 2018, we, we, all, we, uh, we announced a $1 billion fund. I think we probably invested more than, a, more than that now. Um, so when we continue to invest in the industry, but that's not all cash. So um, a lot of that is equity swaps, et cetera. So we don't have that much cash yet. So we'll, we'll have to, so, but, um, uh, so the, our investment thesis is basically anything that helps to grow the industry. So typically those are infrastructure projects in the industry. So uh, we have invested in multiple wallets. Uh, we acquired cross wallet hundred percent. And then um, we, invest, we, even after that, we invested in multiple other wallets like ISAFPAL, which is a, hardware wallet. Uh, we've, we've recently invested in Math Wallet, uh, which is another mobile or web uh, wallet, which is an um, uh, altcoin wallet. They support a very large number of blockchains. Um, they have a very active development team. Um, uh, we invest in payment, uh, payment uh, invest and acquire payment services businesses, uh, Swipe, um, other payment solutions. Uh, we invest in like um, other block, even other, uh, we fund other blockchain developments. We have a, like a, a ecosystem fund. Uh, we give out grants that those are typically much smaller in number, 100K here, 50K there, 250K somewhere else. Um, those type of numbers for er much earlier prototype level projects. So um, yeah, we, we do a combination of those things. And um, so um, from, from my personal perspective, um, uh, we also try not to invest in projects that are short-term driven. So um, if, the, if, if the project is actually purely pro profit-based uh, driven, we actually don't want to invest. Um, those are typically much short-term much short focused. Uh, we want to build things that's, um, that's going to be, we want to look for companies that's building products people will use five years, 10 years from now. And, and, and we want those typically, ideally that people don't even think about that they're, they're using those products. So we, we want things like really low level infrastructure stuff. So um, that's kind of where, uh, that's kind of what, what we're aiming for. You know, you Bitcoin just celebrated its its twelfth birthday. Uh, you're you're still in in you know you're you're not in your teens yet either. Uh, but 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 you're close. Yeah. When you reach that age of you know you've been in the ecosystem, you know in, in the next five years, in the next ten years, how would you describe Binance? Once upon a time, in its early days, it was a cryptocurrency exchange. Yep. A decade from now, how do you envision that we would describe Binance? How would we describe your business? 
Um, well, I, I would say, I would hope that, so I think when we first started, we started as a centralized exchange. So that's mm -hmm. like, we started as a centralized crypto to crypto exchange. So that's very clear. And then unfortunately, that's the thing that people associate us with still. And that's still our, the, the largest part of our business uh, for sure. But um, we're doing a lot of other things. So in 10 years from now or five to 10 years from now, I would ideally just let, uh, hope people just think of Binance as a brand or a collection of businesses or ecosystem projects that's kind of in the crypto space. So hopefully they, um, it's, it's, it's just that yellow uh, brand um, in this, um, that, that occupies a little corner in this, um, in this crypto sphere. And so there should be multiple projects going on. There should be, ideally, they probably there will still be the centralized exchange. There should be a, there should be multiple decentralized exchanges, um, either um, uh, developed by community members or uh, some of our sort of current core team members that may spin out. Um, and they may be wallet services. They may be payment services. Uh, and um, I want Binance to be as decentralized as possible uh, to the extent possible. So we may look at different ways to sort of just decentralize Binance completely uh, if we can. So uh, in 10 years, I definitely want uh, want us to reach that level of decentralization. Um, so hopefully, people don't don't refer Binance as a company or as an, even an organization. It's just an ecosystem that's there. So um, um, so hopefully we can reach that point. Um, there's a lot of challenges, a lot of hurdles to do that. Um, there's also a lot of things I even haven't come thought through. Um, there, there, I don't have solutions for everything. Um, but as we uh, hopefully as time goes on, those things will become clear. So I eventually just want Binance to be like just kind of a brand um, of a collect collection of different businesses that we actually may or may not own or have have even involvement with. Um, so um, that's kind of, um, that would be actually an ideal situation in my mind in 10 years. Yeah, you don't even have to run it. It's it's an ecosystem. Um, yeah. that, that, that is an in, it, incredible vision. Um, we'll certainly be keeping track. And now it's that point as we wrap up, I got to ask you to join us for Forecast Forecast. This is where we ask newsmaker thought leaders and CEOs just like you uh, for their predictions for 2021. So are you ready? Um, well, I'm not very good at predictions, but I'll try. <laughs> <laughs> CZ, you, you, well, you have a pretty good track record uh, considering what you've built. So, so I'll, I'll give you that. Um, you know, 2020 what was just... Uh, almost an inexplicable kind of year. Um, what, what precedes it now? We're in 2021. We saw the rise of DeFi in 2020. We saw a whole host of things. In your view, what are the top three developments that you think are gonna happen in this space in 2021? Um, I would say I'll pick the easy one first. I think institutional adoption is definitely going to increase in 2021. So now there's, um, um, I think, in, uh, institute, especially uh, corporate treasury. Um, so I, th those guys have a lot of money. That's probably like 60 trillion just in the U.S. market alone uh, in terms of a stock, in st just equity markets. If you look at derivatives and other things, that's even bigger. So I think um, uh, that alone probably will push the price of Bitcoin and also other cryptocurrencies up quite significantly. So um, if I were to, so um, the thing, uh, I, I think for me, I always have a much longer term vision in terms of where the industry is going. And whereas even one year is kind of short for me for to predict specifically. So I don't know what the price is going to be at the end of the year, um, whether it's like a million or a 200K, et cetera. Um, so that's really hard for me to be accurate. But um, the, the, the way we have structured the business is that, um, we know the long-term thing, uh, 10 years, 20, year, 20 years out, um, crypto will be everywhere. The market cap will be uh, 100X, 1000X from where it is. And we just wanna be in this industry and we wanna work on products that people use. And then we try to dynamically adjust. Um, if there's a crypto winter, then we adjust accordingly. If there's a crypto summer, it's the bull market, then we adjust accordingly. So we adjust fairly dynamically. But if you were gonna press me for like a, a prediction, I would say, look, uh, Bitcoin is probably gonna do another five to 10X this year uh, alone. So uh, I would put it, I would put it there. Uh, I would put it somewhere around like 150K to like, I don't know, uh, to 400K ish um, in terms of Bitcoin price. And the other crypto assets probably going to rise with more or less with, with Bitcoin. Sometimes they'll be slower, sometimes they'll be faster. Um, so that's kind, of, that's kind of my sort of range um, that I'm, I think there's a very high chance of that happening. But of course, there's also a chance of we enter another crypto winter. I think the chance is smaller, but when it happens, it's hundred percent. But um, so um, it's very hard to put uh, accurate numbers on those, but we are prepared for both scenarios. Um, so we'll just see where the market takes us. 
All right, so that's a price prediction. What, what about developments in this space? Are we going to see more activity in DeFi? Uh, what about interoperability? What do you think the big trends that we should be watching out for will be this year? Yeah, that's a that's a super hard one to predict. Like uh, to be honest, even at the beginning of um, 2020, if you ask me what's the what's the next big thing, I would not have said stablecoin trading, uh, like on mm. on, on uh, like a, on a decentralized exchange. That would that that just wasn't intuitive. Well, that's actually mm. counterintuitive. So those what's going to be the next hot thing is really really hard to predict. I think DeFi was hot in 2020. Um, I think it will continue to grow, but I'm skeptical that it will be hot again. Um, I think we'll continue to grow, which is actually healthier. But it, we well, we probably don't need to see another crazy, um, crazy like uh, exponential jump. Um, so that's um, what's going to be the next thing. Actually, I'm not so sure to be honest. Um, I yeah, um, I really don't know. <laughs> it just yeah, we'll, well, we, we'll just have maybe, to wait and see. Yeah. Maybe I'll make a prediction. Maybe you're going to buy that Tesla, and somebody's going to buy some Bitcoin. Um, I. I, I <laughs> That I think very, that that I think has a very high chance of happening. So um, yeah, even if I, uh, and the other thing is uh, uh, I gotta figure out where to donate that Tesla. I don't drive, so I will have to give it away somewhere. Well, um, judging on on the the contributions and and uh, the the charity donations that Binance has made over the the past year, I, I'm sure you can. I'm sure you've got many many uh, good causes that you've already chosen. Hey, CZ, thank you so much. Really appreciate the time that you've spent with us here at Forecast. Thank, uh, thank you so much, Angie. Thanks for having me. Uh, thanks for, Absolutely. for listening. Thank you for joining us on Word on the Block. And thank you, everyone, for joining us on this latest episode. I'm Angie Lau, Forecast News Editor-in-Chief. And that was CZ. Until the next time. If you like that, come back for more. All you have to do is click like, Always comment, we love that, and subscribe. And don't forget to watch the next one.